Okay. And for those of you that are looking for nursing and or CHES credits, a post survey will be made available to you at the end of this presentation. 100% completion is required to obtain CEUs and you will not be able to award CEUs if you leave the presentation early. Additionally, there are polls throughout this presentation and we are expecting you to participate if you're looking to obtain these CEUs so we can confirm attendance. Before we begin, I do have a few statements to review. Our disclosure statement for this presentation is as follows. The planning committee, presenters, and content reviewers have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Disclosure forms are required and they are reviewed for issues. There will be no discussion of off-label use of FDA-approved products. There is no commercial support for this program. Speakers are required to present balanced and unbiased presentations. The presentation content has been reviewed and any bias has been eliminated. Our learning outcome for this presentation is at the conclusion of the educational activity, nurses and everyone else with us today will self-report a gain in knowledge on the adverse effects of tobacco use on patient health and referral sources in New Jersey by completing a learner satisfaction evaluation. The process for awarding contact hours specifically for nurses. Participants who successfully complete 100% of this educational activity will receive one contact hour. No partial credit is given. The steps for successful completion are as follows. Attendance for entire conference in a completed evaluation form within one week. An evaluation will be available online at the conclusion of this activity. Upon receipt of the completed evaluation by designated deadline, SNDPC will email a certificate of attendance within one week. In our accreditation statement, Southern New Jersey Perinatal Cooperative is an approved provider of nursing continuing professional development by the New Jersey State Nurses Association, an accredited approver by the New American Nurses Credentialing Center's Commission on Accreditation. The provider number is P1062 forward slash 1922. And to begin today's presentation, I do want to review our objectives. Our first objective is to develop practice-wide protocol to assess and address tobacco use by utilizing Center for Disease Control's evidence-based Ask, Advise, Refer brief intervention model. Our second objective is to apply motivational messages about tobacco use into regular interactions with our clients. And our third is to summarize the health risks associated with smoking, exposure to second and third-hand smoke, tobacco dependence, and electronic nicotine delivery systems. This slide shows some important information from the World Health Organization on COVID-19 as it relates to smoking and vaping. Smokers are more likely to be more vulnerable to COVID-19. The act of smoking means that fingers and possibly contaminated cigarettes are in contact with lips, which increases the possibility of transmission of virus from hand to mouth. Smokers may also already have a lung disease or reduced lung capacity, which would greatly increase the risk of serious illness. Conditions that increase oxygen needs or reduce the ability of the body to use it properly will put patients at a higher risk of serious lung condition, such as pneumonia. And this PDF that we have on this slide is available at cdc.gov. It was released April of 2020, and we would like to highlight that the CDC lists smoking as a condition of a compromised immune system. Therefore, anyone that is a smoker or does vape, they are at higher risk of severe illness from COVID-19. For the next few slides, we are going to look at the current smoking trends in both the United States and the state of New Jersey. The national smoking rate is at 13.7%, so almost 14, and the rate of the New Jersey adult resident smoke is at 14.1%, but it's still important to note that the, high, that the New Jersey rate is still higher than the national. 
New Jersey pregnant women fall at 3.6%. The New Jersey high school smoking rate in 2016 was at 4.7% compared to the national rate at 8.8%. However, it is important to note that the rate for any tobacco use among high school students is at 14.2% and at 19.5% for the nation. Tobacco use remains an epidemic for both adults and the youth. This slide reflects the adult smoking rate for all the counties in New Jersey. The red font that you see on this graphic shows an increase in the smoking rate and the green font indicates a decrease in the smoking rate. I would like to point out that from 2018, from 2019, there was no change in the smoking rate in any county. Additionally, the smoking rate for New Jersey shows that there hasn't been a change since 2017 which verifies that there is still a lot of work to be done. And also, smoking has an impact on healthcare. For every dollar spent on tobacco prevention, states can reduce tobacco-related healthcare expenditures and hospitalizations by up to $55. Smoking is estimated to cost the United States between 132.5 and 175.9 billion for medical expenses, as well as $151 billion in lost productivity due to premature death every year. And for the sake of this training today, everyone that is listening in is going to be considered a clinician, whether you're a nurse, social worker, health educator, counselor, you are a clinician. And if today you are viewing as a consumer, you can use these tools to talk to your loved ones as well. Ask Advisory Refer is a brief intervention model that meets the clinical practice guidelines for treating tobacco use and dependence. Tobacco dependence is a chronic disease that often requires repeated intervention and multiple attempts to quit. Clinicians should encourage every patient willing to make a quit attempt to use the counseling treatments and medications recommended in this guideline. Brief tobacco dependence treatment is effective. Clinicians should offer every patient who uses tobacco at least the brief treatments shown to be effective in this guideline. Brief tobacco cessation interventions may only take a small amount of office time, but when successful, it can greatly improve your patient's quality of life. 70% of smokers want to quit smoking. And decades of research shows us that clinicians can have an important impact on their patient's likelihood of achieving cessation. Compared to patients who receive no assistance from a physician, patients who do receive assistance are between one and a half and two times more likely to quit successfully for five months or more. And so it is important to remember, it only takes three minutes to use the Ask Advice Refer tobacco brief intervention model. So let's quickly review the key takeaways, but before we do so, I do wanna run the first poll question. On average, how long does it take to implement the Ask, Advise, Refer intervention? About 15 more seconds. Perfect, so we can see that the majority answered correctly. It only takes three minutes to implement this intervention that meets the clinical practice guidelines for treating tobacco dependency. That could be three minutes that can drastically alter the course of your patient's quality of life. So here is a summary of the process. First is to ask, ask about their tobacco use. Second is to advise. We want to advise tobacco users to quit, and we are also going to determine their readiness to do so. And lastly, we are going to refer them to resources, many of which we will cover today. So within the first minute, like I said, the purpose is to ask. 
Our goal is to make the client comfortable talking about their tobacco use. It is important to ask at every visit if our patient is smoking because they may have resumed smoking since the last time you've seen them. Rather than using the yes, no question that is often found in our electronic health records, we want to use open-ended questions to engage the client. Something like, tell me about your tobacco use. Remember to be non-judgmental in the way that we are asking. And be prepared because most clients are not ready to talk about their tobacco use during their office visit. They could be caught off guard and may not want to talk about their smoking status. Again, we want to ask open-ended and non-judgmental questions. We start by asking about the type and amount of tobacco use. There are some suggestions on this slide, like describe for me what your tobacco use in the past looked like, or like the one I suggested earlier, tell me about your tobacco use. Non-smokers and ex-smokers will provide you with their no in a form of a sentence. It may sound like, no, I haven't smoked in three years, or no, I have never smoked. If identified as a current or former smoker, keep the conversation going by asking, how many cigarettes per day do you smoke? Or how many cigars per day do you smoke? And increasingly more relevant in today, how often do you puff on your e-cigarette or vape? And for the client that quit using tobacco products, remember to congratulate them and encourage them to continue cessation. Also, follow up with them with relapse prevention information. Provide them with contact information that can help them remain tobacco-free. The next step is clear. We want to use this second minute to advise our client to quit smoking. We do this in a clear and strong message. We also, excuse me, this is also where we determine their readiness to quit. Most physicians report that they discuss smoking with their patients, but more than half of patients who smoke report that their physicians have not advised them to do so. Although this may reflect selective recall, a clear and strong message will avoid this perception. Brief statements such as, you need to give up cigarettes are not perceived as strong advice to quit. The slide shows sample message scripting, a clear message like, my best advice for you and your family is for you to quit smoking, is appropriate. Your message could be strong and state the necessity for action. As your clinician, I need you to know that quitting smoking is the most important decision you can make to protect your own health. It is also suggested to personalize the message and tie tobacco use to current symptoms and health concerns or the exposure to children. Some additional communication starters. Determine possible barriers that your patient may have to quitting. That could be something like living with another smoker. Don't forget to talk about previous quit attempts. Found out what had worked in the past and what hadn't worked. Again, I want to highlight that within this, within this second minute, we are determining their readiness to enroll in a tobacco treatment program, as well as having an open conversation about their history of smoking cessation medications and nicotine replacement therapies, which is often abbreviated as NRT. This image shows the seven FDA approved medications and how to use them. It is available to download from our toolkit, which can be found on the New Jersey Quitline website. The link for our toolkit will be shared in the chat at the conclusion of this presentation. I would like to also mention that in New Jersey, Medicaid does cover all seven of these FDA approved medications with a prescription from the provider. The provider should also emphasize the importance of quitting. As providers, employ the teachable moment before health problems arise or get worse. Discuss the impact smoking has on current health or illness status, its impact on children and others in the home, including our pets, because those are family as well. It costs 
and its costs associated to smoking. Some facts that may be persuasive in that moment are, on average, it takes six to 10 quit attempts in an individual's lifetime to quit smoking for good. So we're reiterating that perhaps their first couple times were unsuccessful doesn't mean that they're always going to be unsuccessful and that they're never going to be smoke-free. There are 7,000 chemicals in cigarettes. Can you believe that? 7,000? Smoking triples risk of SIDS in infants. And be sure to mention the facts about second and third-hand smoke. The next couple of slides are going to provide some sample scripting for different populations. For the purpose of leaving some time at the end of this presentation for questions, I will only be highlighting a few of my favorites. However, if you are interested in obtaining these slides, we can make them available for you. My favorite from this slide is, using support services can more than double your chances of quitting. Counseling and nicotine replacement therapies are very effective. Another example, but for the pregnant mother, as your clinician, provider, social work, maybe family member or friend, I need you to know that not smoking is the most important decision you can make to protect your baby and your own health. And lastly, scripting for the youth. And remember that any tobacco use among high school students in New Jersey is at nearly 15%. So it is especially important to advise them to quit smoking. You can say, tobacco companies target you to make up for the consumers they lose every day from dying from tobacco use or quitting. In the last minute of our Ask Advise Refer Tobacco Brief Intervention, we refer our patients to smoking cessation resources. And remember, within this last minute, all we are doing is referring. We could be referring them to Moms Quit Connection for Families or Moms Quit for Kids, the New Jersey Quit Line, and the New Jersey Quit Centers. Those are the three free resources in the state of New Jersey, and we're going to be discussing them in greater detail shortly. But before we move on, here is a roadmap of Ask, Advise, Refer. It is a great summary of the process that we just went through. Remember, we spend the first minute asking the client to describe their tobacco use in any form. If they acknowledge that they are a smoker, you advise them. The best thing you can do for your health is to quit smoking. I can help. Remember, this is also where we determine their willingness to quit. This is where we determine their willingness to quit. If, there are, if they are ready to quit, the next step is to refer them to the free cessation resources and discuss medication. If they are not ready, provide education material and website information. Remind them with a clear and strong message that you are encouraging, encouraging them to quit. And don't forget to ask them about their smoking status the next time you see them. If they are not a smoker or a previous smoker, we wanna congratulate them and provide relapse prevention materials to those who have a history. Now that we have covered Ask, Advise, Refer, Frame, as clinicians, we need to know what nicotine addiction is and what it looks like. But before we move on, I'm going to run the second poll. When do you determine the patient's readiness to quit smoking? Another 15 seconds. Perfect, thank you for everyone that has participated. So briefly, in the first minute, all we are doing is asking if they are, are a smoker. In the second minute, we are advising them to quit and determining their readiness to quit. And lastly, refer. Refer is when we're referring them to New Jersey resources. So the answer to this question is advice. Nicotine has an impact both on our nation and on our patients. 
smokers become addicted to nicotine, a drug that is found naturally in tobacco. More people in the United States are addicted to nicotine than to any other drug. Research even suggests that nicotine may be as addictive as heroin, cocaine, or alcohol. Quitting smoking is really hard and oftentimes requires several attempts. People who stop smoking often start again because of withdrawal symptoms, stress, and weight gain, which is why we always provide cessation material for even those that have quit. As I mentioned earlier, cigarette smoking is a deadly mix of more than 7,000 chemicals. Hundreds are toxic and over 70 are known to cause cancer. Cigarette smoke contains approximately two milligrams of nicotine per cigarette. This is important to know when discussing nicotine replacement therapy with a patient or client. To avoid withdrawal, replacing the nicotine with NRT in approximately the same quantity that they would receive in a regular cigarette would be the goal. We already established that smoking is an addiction. However, it is important to know that addiction is a powerful tool and there are three components to addiction. The first component is physical. A physical craving for tobacco and withdrawal symptoms may be present in the first, may be present in the absence of the drug, excuse me. Habitual, the use of ritualistic and done without thought. Often smokers purchase the same brand of cigarettes, use a lighter or use a match. They pack their cigarettes the same way. All of these are signs of a habit. And finally, psychological, the belief that the user cannot function without the habit. They may question how they're going to handle stressful situations without a cigarette. It only takes a few puffs of a cigarette or an e-cigarette for nicotine to enter the body. Within seven to 10 seconds, the nicotine travels up to the brain's nicotine receptors. High levels of nicotine creates a buzz feeling and releases endorphins. That's when your shoulders kind of go down and they're no longer at your ears. It's that feel good chemical. As the nicotine levels drop in the brain, the body begins to go through withdrawal. When withdrawal, the following symptoms can occur. Cravings for a cigarette, dizziness, headaches, coughing, trouble concentrating, irritability, fatigue, and constipation. The cycle occurs about every two hours. So when we're looking at these recovery symptoms, we want to avoid saying withdrawal symptoms. So we always say recovery, and the reason is because withdrawal has a negative connotation to it. The symptoms listed here aren't all-encompassing. Some people will have more of these, some people will have less. It really depends on the person, how much, and how long they have been smoking. This slide is a great motivational tool because it shows how the body begins to heal within minutes. You can see that within the first hours, blood pressure and heart rate return to normal. Within two days, nicotine is eliminated from the body. In just three days, their breathing, breathing becomes easier. After one year of being smoke-free, your risk of heart attack has decreased by 50%. And in 10 years, your risk of lung cancer has also decreased by 50%. Within 15 years, their heart attack risk is the same as someone who has never smoked. So what are the health effects of tobacco use? During the advised phase of your training, you can use these facts to assist you in your motivational interviewing. Smoking harms nearly every organ in the body, causing many diseases and reducing the health of smokers in general. More deaths are caused each year by tobacco use than all deaths from HIV, illegal drug use, alcohol, alcohol use, motor vehicle injuries, fires, suicides, and murders combined. From this chart, you can see that smoking really does affect the whole body. There are many different forms of cancers, pulmonary disease, cardiovascular diseases, 
in other effects such as diabetes and cataracts. In this chart here, we're going to see how it impacts specific groups. We have the impacts here on women, babies, fetuses, and the youth. So it can impact infertility and conception delay. For a fetus, there is a 35% higher infant mortality rate. And for the babies, there is an increase in death and disability. Smoking lowers milk supplies for mothers and for the youth, they are likely to develop asthma and become addicted faster. I do wanna say before we move on to the next slides, that if there are mothers that are currently using tobacco, I strongly encourage you to quit. However, the benefits of breastfeeding do outweigh the risks of nicotine, and breastfeeding is encouraged according to the American College of Pediatrics. Lastly, I want to finish up this section with the impact of smoking that it has on medications and mental health. It can alter the metabolic rate. It affects antidepressants and antipsychotics. Dose adjustments may be needed when quitting, but nicotine replacement therapy does not interfere with antidepressants and antipsychotics. This link here directs you to a list of drug interactions if you are interested. Briefly, I do want to touch on mental health and the impact smoking has. Almost half of annual deaths from smoking are from people with a mental illness or substance abuse disorder. Most common causes are death of death are ones that are caused by smoking. That's heart disease, cancer, and lung disease. Quitting is the most effective when combined with mental health care motivational in interviewing, and nicotine replacement therapy. To move on to environmental smoke, we are talking about secondhand and thirdhand smoke. This training would not be comprehensive without mentioning how environmental tobacco smoke affects both oneself and our loved ones. It is important to encourage a smoke-free environment. Secondhand smoke is the combination of smoke from the burning end of the cigarette and the smoke breathed out by smokers. Secondhand smoke contains about 7,000 chemicals and over 70 are cancer-causing chemicals. There is no safe amount of secondhand smoke. The U.S. Surgeon General reports released in 2006 and 2010 stated that secondhand smoke is a Class A carcinogen with no safe level of exposure. Non-smokers who are exposed to secondhand smoke at home or at the workplace are at an increased risk of developing lung cancer, coronary heart disease, and respiratory problems. 41,000 non-smokers die every year from exposure to tobacco smoke. About four out of 10 U.S. children aged three to 11 are exposed to secondhand smoke. 56% of New Jersey students in ninth to 12th grade are non-smokers non exposed to secondhand smoke. That contributes to childhood asthma. We see here that eight to 13% of asthma cases in children are under the age of 15 years old. It increases frequency of episodes and severity of symptoms. 200,000 to 1 million asthmatic children are affected by secondhand smoke. <clears throat> Possible problems with cognitive functioning and behavioral development. They are more likely to become smokers, and children are also more likely to suffer from ear infections, bronchitis, and pneumonia, all from secondhand smoke. Thirdhand smoke. A lot of people haven't heard of thirdhand smoke before. After the after secondhand smoke has become so popular, thirdhand smoke was kind of put on the back end. But thirdhand smoke refers to the toxins from cigarette smoke that stick to soft surfaces. Through thirdhand smoke, people can be exposed to the same toxins found in tobacco smoke. Low levels of toxins can build up to dangerous levels in the body, causing learning problems for children. Thirdhand smoke can stay on unwashed surfaces for days, weeks, and even months. These services can include walls, floors, 
counters, your clothes, etc. With those things in mind, we want to encourage a smoke-free home and a smoke-free car. Secondhand smoke causes nearly 34,000 premature deaths from heart disease each year in the United States among non-smokers. A smoke-free environment decreases the health risks associated with environmental tobacco smoke. Scientific evidence indicates that there is a no risk-free level of exposure to secondhand smoke, which means that smoking in another room in your home does not count as a smoke-free environment. Next, we'll be talking about electronic nicotine delivery systems because many of our clients may be using vapes rather than traditional cigarettes. Please note though, that this is a very brief introduction to ENDS. And if you are interested in more information and in-depth presentations, I am available. My contact information will be at the end of this presentation. Before we move on, we are going to run the third poll. How many chemicals are in each cigarette? About 15 more seconds. All right, thank you for everyone that has participated. And we can see here that the majority got this correct. 7,000 chemicals are in about every cigarette. So vaping is a term introduced by the electronic smoking device industry to refer to any electronic vaporizer, such as e-cigarettes, vapes, mods, vape pens, etc. The term can incorrectly lead people to believe that using electronic vaporizers produce a harmless water vapor. But in reality, these devices produce potentially harmful aerosols that are inhaled into the lungs and exhaled into the environment. When a person inhales, a sensor triggers the vaporizer to heat a small amount of liquid flavoring. The liquid turns into a vapor and is inhaled into the lungs. The e-cigarette heats nicotine but does not burn like a traditional tobacco cigarette. The vapor does not contain the 7,000 chemicals traditional cigarette smoking does. This slide just shows some of the most recent products in the vaping industry. You can see that these products are getting very innovative. Notice that they are small, colorful, and in shaped in a way that may be very appealing to the youth. We can see here that there is even a watch that functions as both a watch and a vape. And there is the jewel on the bottom there that is very popular amongst the youth, showing that these products can be extremely convenient. Some facts on e-cigarettes are, it is not an FDA approved cessation device. So it's not one of those seven that we mentioned earlier. Labeling is often inaccurate and nicotine content is not consistent. So is it safer? Well, the vapor is not water, it is an aerosol. And although e-cigarette vapor does not contain 7,000 chemicals found in cigarette smoke, the vapor can contain toxins, metals, ultra fine particles that are 99% of these products do contain nicotine. And flavoring that is generally recognized as safe for use in foods is not safe for inhalation. And the effects of many of these, many of these inhaled flavor, flavorings are largely unknown and may cause lung inflammation and disease. E-cigarette or vaping product use associated lung injury is the name given by the CDC for injury to the lungs caused by vaping. Symptoms can include coughing, nausea, fatigue, fever, vomiting. And the theories are, in all cases, some kind of vape product was used, vitamin E, acetate, and black market cannabis, for example, and users inhale oil-like substances that may coat the lungs. 
there are some other concerns because they are linked to seizures, cardiovascular disease, as well as depression. Over 5.4 million youth are current e-cigarette users. That is one in four U.S. high school students and one in 10 middle school students. E-cigarettes have been the most commonly tobacco product used among the youth since 2014. And notice on the slide here that there is a marketing campaign. I want to point out that, point out that sticky note. It says to study, groceries, band practice, vape time, and really emphasizing that this tag was targeted to the youth. And it is allowed because vaping is not included in the master settlement agreement. So the new generation of tobacco addiction. In 2019, more than one third of high school e-cigarette users now report 20 or more days per month, while 18% of middle school users report such frequent use. In 2019, 64% of high school students who used e-cigarettes reported using mint or menthol flavored products. That's a 13% increase from 2018. So we need to understand why the youth is using these vaping products. The FDA and the CDC analyzed data from the National Youth Tobacco Survey to assess the use, and they found that they are most commonly used by family or friend. It is extremely available and the flavors are available and that there is a belief that they are less harmful. This slide shows that the use of e-cigarettes is a problem among those under 24 years of age. While there was a rise in e-cigarette use among young adults, the larger rise was among middle school and high school students. Seven million adults use e-cigarettes. About 60% of adult e-cigarette use are also dual users. State and local action. So in 2010, New Jersey Smoke-Free Air Act was revised to include a ban on electronic smoking devices in indoor public places and workplaces. The age of sale increased from 19 to 21. The New Jersey Smoke-Free Smoke -free Air Act also includes public beaches and parks, so that includes smoking and vaping. And so in 2000, 2019, there was a task force created to investigate EMS. And in January of 2020, New Jersey was the first state in the nation to impose a permanent ban on flavored vape products. The legislation prohibits the sale and distribution of flavored vape products, including menthol. So what is the federal action in 2016, FDA is approved to regulate all tobacco products. So that requires manufacturers and retailers to submit a pre-market review application by 2018. This deadline has been extended multiple times and it was in September of 2020, but because of COVID-19, we're expecting that deadline to be extended again. In 2018, all covered tobacco products must bear the required nicotine addictiveness warning statement on product packages and advertisements. And in December of 2019, the president signed legislation to amend the, food, the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act and raise the federal minimum age of sale of tobacco products from 18 to 21. So now let's talk about some available cessation resources in New Jersey and where you can refer these patients that we've been talking about. So this is a summary slide of the free resources. We have Mom's Quit Connection for Families, Quit for Kids, the New Jersey Quit Line, and New Jersey Quit Centers. Like I said, these slides can be made available to you so you don't have to quickly scribble down this information. Mom's Quick Connection for Families is a free, unlimited smoking cessation program. It offers face-to-face -face counseling in the southern region of New Jersey and telephone counseling for northern and central New Jersey. There is texting support and educational self-help materials. Pregnant mothers, it's for pregnant or mothers with children seven years old or younger. 
And it also includes caregivers. So that could be a father, a babysitter, grandparents. And it, you, the client does not need to be ready to quit to enroll into this program. Our counselors are available to just talk and determine their readiness. So here are our referral options and our times our services are available. So you can refer by fax, email, there's a self-referral, as well as a web referral, including Facebook. And the fax referral form can be downloaded from tobaccofreenj.com. Mom's Quick Connection can personalize the top section of this form for each provider in your office. The bottom section of the form is completed and signed by the client to meet HIPAA compliance. And remember, we accept clients in any stage of readiness. So here is the provider follow-up. Mom's Quick Connection generates and sends to individual providers a report documenting the status of each patient they refer to the program. And so we have Quit for Kids texting, texting support program. It's a tar the target audience is the same as the previous program. The services are at no cost. There is an automated set of personalized messages. And there is also a live chat option if they want to speak to a tobacco cessation specialist. Enrollment options include online as well as a Facebook link or they can text the keyword quit for kids to 53016. There is also an automatic referral from the perinatal risk assessment. So now we move on to the New Jersey quit line. This is a free telephone service for New Jersey residents who are 18 years or older, but they must be ready to quit. There are two quick phone calls. You can have three quit attempts per year, and for those who qualify, free nicotine patches are available. And there is a tailored quit line participant experience where there is a portal. So it is self-guided. There is email support, a web coach, a quick guide, anything that they might need to really assist them in their quit journey. The referral options are a fax referral, email, or an automatic referral from the provider via the electronic health record, a self-referral, self or a web referral. The provider is asked to only fax refer patients to the New Jersey quit line who are in a stage where they're at least thinking about making a quit attempt in the future. Your office will become a quit line partner as soon as you start using this form. We will deliver customized fax referral forms to your office. It's easy to use for both the professional and the client. The form encourages providers to discuss cessation and offer resources. And you also must select yes, that you are a HIPAA compliant entity to receive an outcome report for the person that you refer to the quit line. And that is, uh, I can show you where that is right now. That is right here. You want to click yes there. So the feedback for the NJ quit line. The form looks like this. Your office, like I said, does become a quit line partner as soon as you start using this form. We deliver customized fax forms to your office, and this gives a summary of your participant outcome. So any patient that you require, you rec recommend it to the quit line, will receive this as well. And then so we're, now we're moving on to our New Jersey quit center locations. And you can see them here in the colored counties. There are 11 quit centers throughout New Jersey. And to locate your local quit center, visit tobaccofreenewjersey.com. This is individual and group counseling. It provides residents with the resources to stop or reduce their tobacco product use. Enrolled clients of the quit center may qualify for free NRT as part of their treatment plan. I also wanna emphasize, New Jersey quit centers do assist the youth to quit smoking. However, it is with parental permission as well as the quit center's permission to treat this client. And lastly, here is the toolkit that I had mentioned earlier in this presentation. It could be downloaded for free at the New Jersey Quit Line website. 
So in summary, um, I do have a summary section, but I do want to run our final poll question. Based on what you learned today, what action do you plan to take? We'll give about 10 more seconds. Thank you for everyone that participated. And I recognize that everyone on this call today may not be in a position to take action, but it's great to hear that you're going to bring this information to your team and encourage them to use the Ask Advisory Firm model. If you need a presentation for your specific organization, please do not hesitate to reach out to me. So in, con in conclusion, clinicians have an impact. Tobacco addiction is a chronic disease and deserves ongoing clinical treatment. Effective smoking cessation can reduce illness and improve patient quality of life. Every time, ask your pa patients if they use tobacco. Advise them to quit and refer them to the resources available. Here is a list of credible online resources. If you have any questions about the data that we showed in this presentation, that can be provided as well. And here is my contact information. I do want to end with this comic. Do you realize that drugstores make sick people walk all the way to the back for their prescriptions, but healthy ones can buy cigarettes at the front? This was created in the year 2000. And 20 years later, not much has changed other than CVS. And I do want to make a note for those nurses and those who are, make, are looking to obtain chest credits. You can find our survey in the chat box. I'll post those now. And I'm available for any questions. Hello, everyone. This is Heather Jordan now. I am taking a look at our group chat, and I'll pull some questions together for you. Thank you so much for that talk. That was wonderful. We do have a couple of questions about the resources that you talked about today on your talk. Um, some folks are wondering where they can find that fax to quit form, and others are wondering if these materials are available in Spanish. Sure, these are great questions. So all the resources that we talked about, including those fax referral forms, can be found in our toolkit. I'll add the New Jersey quit line link into the chat, so you can just go ahead and click it, and it'll bring you to the website you can find that toolkit at. And some of the resources are available in Spanish, but I'm not entirely sure if all of them are. I know for Mom's Quick Connection, we do not have a Spanish speaker, but I can't speak for the quit centers. I know the quit line, the quit line should have Spanish speakers. Excellent. I can speak on behalf of the quit centers very briefly. Please go to Tobacco Free New Jersey and take a look at the map of the quit centers. Um, all of the quit centers are able to call in to the translation services line and some of them do have Spanish speaking counselors on staff as well. And some of the materials are in fact being translated into Spanish now or they are already available. So you can certainly go directly to each quit center to receive that information for your catchment area. Um, Averly, I'm looking to see. Um, we want to make sure the link to the drug interactions file is in the chat box. I believe someone did post that up, but if you could just take a peek and make sure that link is correct, that would be fab. Um, we do have one participant who asked about the nicotine uptake in a cigarette. You had said two milligrams per cigarette as our guide for when we're thinking about tobacco treatment. Can you um, elaborate on that any more? Sure. So yes, it's two milligrams per cigarette. So if we're talking about per pack, that's 20 cigarettes in a pack. So two milligrams times 20 would be how many milligrams of nicotine in a pack of cigarettes. Um, in vaping products, like I had mentioned, it's pretty inconsistent right now. It's very challenging to kind of calculate that. Uh, so when you're talking about NRT uh, for vaping, 
clients, that would be a better question for a provider. Um, but yes, it's two milligrams per cigarette and there's 20 cigarettes in a pack. So that's about 40 milligrams of nicotine per pack. Excellent. Thank you. We have another question here. Someone asked, how do you become a quit coach? Interesting. Hmm. First, I would recommend um, taking the records of training that they offer. It's called the tobacco dependence treatment training. Um, I don't know when they're offering that, but that's the course that I had taken. And then I would also re recommend looking into becoming CHES certified. CHES stands for a certified health education specialist. It's not necessary for a tobacco treatment specialist. However, it does help when you're delivering these education materials. Excellent. So, um, Kimberly out there, we see you in the chat. Congratulations on quitting. That's wonderful for your health. You are a role model. Um, so if you have any additional questions, Kimberly, please feel free to email myself or today's presenter and we can link you up with additional resources. Um, uh, we do have a training. If you go to tobacco dependence program, that is our four day training program. Um, and that can get you started with thinking through how to become a quick coach. I am looking to see if there are any additional questions. I think we've touched on all of them. And I will go through the presentation to get that drug interaction link. Just give me one moment. Excellent. All right. Well, I think we, if anyone else has a question, please go ahead and type it in the chat box. Um, we do have that link there for the medication interaction, so that's great. Um, Michelle, do you want to take it away? Sounds great, Heather. Thank you so much. On behalf of our team here at Rutgers Cancer Institute, Screen NJ, and the New Jersey Quit Line, we thank you so much for your time and joining us today. And we encourage you for next week's session, we'll be talking about everything that you need to know about tobacco products and vaping. So if you haven't signed up for those sessions next, next week, we still have spaces available. So we encourage you to register and sign up today. And please note that we will also be sharing all of the um, presentation material as well as the recorded presentations. We'll be e-blasting this out to everyone next week. Um, we're posting these videos on our YouTube channel so you'll be able to come back and review any materials and have access to the slides that are in the videos. So thank you so much everyone. On behalf of our team, we wish everyone continued health and safety during this time and we look forward to seeing you next week. Be well and stay safe. Good morning, everyone. This is Heather Jordan speaking now. Um, that was a fantastic talk. We do have a couple of questions in the chat box. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and read one of them out, um, and hopefully we can provide some good feedback. Question number one for you is, if I understand correctly, we would be a referral tool. It would be great to understand a bit better how the therapies work to be able to know how to direct the prospect. So therapies are in quotation marks. I'm not quite sure if this participant is talking about the, the medications that are available or the different quit services that are available. So do you want to go ahead and maybe talk a bit about um, quit services and other things, all these therapies that are out there? Absolutely. Sure. And it, it really, oh, go ahead. That was me. Yeah, I, I am, my name is Valeria, Valeria Tenreiro. I am from the Summit YMCA. So my question goes to, like, for example, if I manage setting a program at the Y where we can mm -hmm. get seventh grade initiative and, you know, kids to join, because I think the vaping thing, as far mm -hmm. as what I see with my children and what they share about their schools, mm -hmm. is a problem. So if I manage getting a program running, uh, you know, at the Y, um, you know, if, if I'm going to refer someone to to go to a, one of these programs. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm sure the questions are gonna be, is this a therapy where, you know, the kids are gonna be 
you know, manage psychologically to be able right. to quit? Or is it that they're going to get drugs or medications mm -hmm. to be able to quit? Or is it going to be a group therapy where a group of, you know what I mean? Absolutely. Uh, that's, a, that's a really good question, especially when you're talking about teens specifically. Mm -hmm. So out of the three resources or four resources that I had mentioned, the only option for youth to receive any kind of counseling might be the better term would be the New Jersey quit centers. And like I said, that is with parental permission and the quit centers permission. And so they do not need to take nicotine replacement therapy. They can just sit in with the group counseling session. When I say therapy, it isn't necessarily like one-on-one -on -one with a therapist where you're, you know, talking about your emotions or your behaviors, things like that. This is more like a, like, oh, I don't want, I also want to say like a journey where you're talking with other people about their trials, their tribulations, their struggles, and how to overcome those, those triggers that might make them want to, to smoke. Um, so that's really what I mean when I'm, when I'm saying therapies, that's kind of just like a broad term, but sometimes counseling is the better term to use because we're not providing, um, like emotional or behavioral therapy. We're just trying to use a tool to assist them in helping them quit. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yes. Um, um, I, what I, what I meant is like, if I have all these, uh, you know, uh, sources that they could reach out i can say well this one uh, you know the form or the the way they are going to treat the person that gets to this is uh, i don't know a therapy or a medical mm -hmm. thing or a you know what i mean yeah so the the toolkit that i had mentioned that is available on the new jersey quit line does go into greater detail about each program so if you want to use that as a tool to provide to parents or to individuals to help them select a program, you can absolutely show them the, the toolkit. Okay, that, that's what I meant. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, we do have another question out here. Is the secondhand effect the same for e-cigarettes and such? And this is from the same person. <laughs> that's a great question. So e-cigarettes and vaping, it's sort of a hot topic. The research is new. I don't want to say that I know the answer to that entirely. You know, we don't totally understand everything about e-cigarette uh, vape and the smoke. Um, I can get back to you with a more definitive answer, but I'm not entirely sure if it's the same. I would probably say it's, it's not because it doesn't contain the same chemicals as a cigarette. Thank you. And at this moment, I am going to put in a plug for the other talks that are part of this series. We do have Evelyn giving a talk about tobacco products and vaping later on in our series. So I'll be dropping the registration link for our other talks into the chat box now. So please think about going ahead and registering for Evelyn's talk and hopefully we'll get a little bit more information at that time about e-cigarettes and the risks of them. So that link has been dropped into the chat box now. Great, right. thank you so much, Heather. We appreciate everyone attending today's session. And as Aberly mentioned, just be sure, especially if you are seeking the continuing education credit for nursing or for um, the certified health educational specialist, please be sure to fill out and complete those surveys and get them back to Everly within the week so that they can generate your certificate of attendance um, there. And we look forward to seeing everyone next week for our session three, which is on what you need to know about tobacco, pro tobacco products and vaping. Have a great day, everyone, and make it a great week. Stay healthy. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so I don't seem to see Heather on uh, the call right now, but maybe I can look through the chat box. And yeah, we'll I'll help as well. Go. Not a problem. Um, so we have one question. Uh, how can the slides be obtained? And um, I'll, oh, hi, Heather. <laughs> we cannot hear you. Um, I, will, I will do the chat box, no problem. Good afternoon, everyone. 
So uh, yeah, the first question is how can the slides be obtained? And uh, so we will be following up via email with uh, presentation information and the slides. Um, and then uh, we have another question. Do you know where the budget will be for tobacco prevention for the new fiscal year in New Jersey? I do not know what the budget will be. I'm sorry. I wish I did. I'm sure everyone wishes they knew what the budget was. Sure. Then, oh, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, we have another question to please review the referral processes for the quit resources. Absolutely. So the referral processes can be found on that toolkit that I had mentioned. I'm happy to add that link in the chat for you. Um, but for Moms Quit Connection, you can just go to momsquit.com. Um, if you're a provider, the form is in the toolkit. We are happy to customize that form for you. And then they can also call us and then we can make sure that they are in contact with a tobacco treatment specialist. For the New Jersey Quit Line, you can go to their website, newjerseyquitline.org, or you could call them. Uh, there is also a forum that is in the toolkit. Um, and then I think you can enroll, you can enroll on their website as well. And then for the New Jersey Quit Centers, if I'm not mistaken, um, you can contact their point person for each individual quit centers and they'll be able to make an appointment for you. I believe they're all virtual right now, um, but I'm not entirely sure. Is uh, the New Jersey quit line is not a 24 hour service, nor is mom's quit connection. Um, I'd be happy. I can pull up the times of those again for you. This is Heather. Can you all hear me now? Yes. Awesome. Hi, everybody. So um, we did have a couple people trying to log in using my registration link. So we'll make sure that we get your names over to the group that's making sure we're ensuring continuing ed processes are being followed. So I am sorry about that. Um, we have a lot of requests for information that I received privately and over the chat. So I put all of your requests into a Word document that I'll be forwarding over to our fabulous speaker. Um, so in the meantime, thank you, Nicolette, for helping with those Q&As for us. Um, does anyone else out there have any additional questions? You can certainly type them in the chat box or if you feel comfortable, you can unmute yourself and ask them live as well. Hi, my name is Fred Seymour, and um, I work with baseball players, uh, mostly minor league players, and most of the tobacco cessation is revolves around combustible smoke mm -hmm. or um, electronic cigarettes. So I saw in the slides, I talked about uh, smokers may be at more of an increased risk um, from suffering from the coronavirus if they mm -hmm. were to obtain the virus. Now, what about spit tobacco users that are, so my, as I guess it's a two-part question. Is that because the combustible smoke, which has the 7,000 chemicals and 70 carcinogens starts to break down your lung capacity, ability to breathe? And so if a spit tobacco user is 50 times more likely to develop an oral cancer or lip cheaper mm -hmm. gum, mm -hmm. where does that put like those guys in terms of their increased health risks if they were to um, incur the coronavirus? If that makes sense to you, my question. Yeah, the question makes sense. And I, I don't want to speak um, too clinically because I am just a health educator. But I, what I will say is that because they're putting their fingers close to their mouth when they're packing the tobacco, um, if their hands are contaminated and they may have COVID-19 on their hands, they are at an increased risk of getting coronavirus. I'm not too sure if they would be considered in greater illness, like greater severe severity of their illness. Um, that would probably be a better question for um, a, visit, a physician, but I'd be happy to get back to you on that. Thank you.
Fred, this is Heather Jordan. Um, if you want to go ahead and send an email to myself or one of the others, uh, Nicolette or Averly, we can certainly forward that question along to our medical director, Michael Steinberg, to weigh in as well. We'd be happy to do that. Thank you. I took his course um, earlier this year, so I'm familiar with Dr. Steinberg too, so I'm happy to do that. Thank you. Excellent. That sounds great. Thank you. And it looks like we are nearing uh, almost five o'clock. So um, I think that's going to be it for our session today. But please, if you have any additional questions, please uh, do not hesitate to send an email. I'd like to thank our wonderful presenter, Eberly Bagassi, and thank you all very much for attending to today's session. We will be following up regarding CEUs and the information from today's presentation. Please be sure to register for our session offered next Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday. It's what you need to know, tobacco products and vaping. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. Thank you, everyone.